Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about a play by Lord Byron called Cain, A Mystery. It was published in 1821. This is something that I read probably 2018-2019 and had a really big impact on me. Kind of drew together a lot of ideas I have had just throughout my life and my studies and practices. And ironically, that's kind of what the play is all about, is coming to these realizations for the central character of the play, Cain based on the biblical character of the same name. So Cain belongs to this time period that's now known as Romantic Satanism, which is something that has been applied to it kind of after the fact. This was kind of a poetic tradition, late 1700s, early 1800s, and they were inspired by the 1600s work Paradise Lost, by Milton, which I'm sure most of you have heard of by now. Most people I think have heard of Paradise Lost. Its impact has been very big on just kind of our understanding of Satan in the modern day, our understanding of heaven and hell. But the interesting thing is that Milton was not in any way really a Satanist. He didn't even mean to necessarily create a hero out of Satan. This was something that came later with people like um, William Blake Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley. And this movement, or what we see now as a movement, kind of rehabilitated Satan into a positive figure, one of liberty and freedom, uh, sexual freedom as well. Everything that we kind of know about him on the positive side of the spectrum when it comes to modern Satanism. So... This was written by Byron. Like he said, he was around in the late 1700s, early 1800s. He was born with a club foot, actually, which he considered his own mark of Cain. And he came from a very abusive background in which he was actively demonized by his mother, at least. I'm not sure if it was the rest of his family as well, but his mother would literally demonize him and associate him with Satan, along with that mark of Cain, as he called it. He was inspired by William Blake, I believe, but it was more that he was close friends with Percy Shelley, who wrote most famous probably for Prometheus Unbound, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I would call Byron's work, especially Cain, kind of the culmination of this romantic satanic movement. And I say that because unlike Milton, Byron meant to come at it this way, and this kind of blasphemous means where Lucifer is legitimately a hero. Also, unlike Blake, Byron kind of committed to this, whereas Blake, his marriage of heaven and hell definitely belongs to the satanic movement, but later he kind of reverted back to Satan being a, the bad guy of his stories and of his poems. And then finally, because he actually used the biblical names and concepts in his story instead of changing them. So... Prometheus Unbound is also part of Romantic Satanism, but of course it uses Zeus and Prometheus instead of the god of the Bible and Cain and Lucifer. So I think it really gives us the best, most peak picture of this literary movement, at least for the time, is here in Cain, a mystery, which is a shame because it seems to be one of the least discussed works from the time. And I know that Shelley and Blake are a lot more famous, of course, as well. It's also important to understand when this came about. This was after the American and French revolutions, kind of right at the end of the Regency. And so there was a lot of, in Byron circles, there was a lot of pro-liberty, anti-authority mentality. So he's very much an anti-authoritarian type of work here in Cain, which is very obvious from the first reading of it. At the time period... Satan had kind of fallen out of popular belief. It was considered silly and primitive to believe that there was an actual devil who was trying to sway people to evil. And as a symbol, Satan was used in that evil form still. So like Napoleon was demonized by his enemies by comparing him to Satan, vice versa. It was always really this kind of negative thing until it came to the romantic Satanists. And I think the other important thing to realize here is that there was a lot of disenchantment during the Enlightenment period, and especially with like disenchantment around Satan, because now it was 
silly to even believe that that being literally existed. And I think a key to the poets that gets missed a lot here is that I feel like there's already an attempt at re-enchantment to try and bring more to this. So it's absolutely a fact that people like Byron and Shelley are what we would probably call atheists now. And they definitely more align with atheistic Satanism, as we might call it. But I don't think that they would agree with the materialism and nihilism we've kind of reached now. Like they saw beauty to life and the poets really thought that they were like the true priests and the true keeper of, you know, a deeper wisdom. And so I don't think it's right to discount the spiritual aspect of these romantic works in the way that we might, you know, discount the spiritual aspects that could be read into someone like LeBay. Also, quick pause here. Nice synchronicity. It is storming like absolute mad outside. So you might hear some rain. You might hear stuff knocking against the windows. Um, I guess the smart thing to do would be to record at a different time, but I kind of get into a... I don't know how to describe it. Like you get into the zone and then you want to go. So if that bothers you, I'm sorry. And I will try to kind of normalize the volume on that as well. But I think it sounds beautiful. Anyways, the other important thing to understand about this time was that there was really strict blasphemy laws in place. You could be legitimately in prison for writing the wrong thing, especially about the church in England, where Byron was writing from. At least originally, I'm not actually sure what he wrote, Cain. I'll have to look into that. I believe it was England, but I'm not completely sure. So there was this pro-Christian slant and these limits on writing that really upset Byron and Shelley in their kind of circle. And so Cain was an attempt to test the limits, so to speak, of what they could get published. And to be sure, it immediately lost its copyright and ended up being pirated. <laughs> so uh, I think he pushed the limits a little too far, which is probably one of the reasons why it ended up being such a great piece of work. The last thing I'll add here and possibly one of the most important is that there was a critic of Byron and his friends named, uh, I believe it's Robert Southey, might have butchered that name, but he wrote this critique directly aimed at Byron and them, in which he says, and I'll quote here, the school which they have set up may properly be called the satanic school, for though their productions breathe the spirit of Belial and their lascivious parts, and spirit of Moloch in those loathsome, loathsome images, atrocities, and horrors which they delight to represent. They are more especially characterized by the satanic spirit of pride and audacious impiety, which still betrays the wretched feelings of hopelessness wherewith it is allied. And Cain was kind of a critique against uh, these accusations, but I, no, not, an, not a critique of the accusations. It was an embracing of them and kind of a, an attack back. And I think that's also critical here is that of all people at this time, Byron openly accepted the title of Satanic. He ended up self-identifying with that, even realizing that he had always identified with that, with his mother's demonization and his, mark of, his own Mark of Cain. So all these, I think, is, is part of the reason why Cain was written the way it is, why it's so good and so strong even today, and also why it's important to the history and genealogy of Satanism as we know it today. So now I just kind of want to recap the story um, as told by Byron with a couple qualifiers here. Um, first of all, it is inevitably, inevitably going to be focused on what I find important. And I think that everybody who listens to this or is interested in anything like this should read the play immediately, um, several times if possible. It's not that long and it's surprisingly easy to read compared to something like Paradise Lost in my opinion. So act one, three act play, it opens with Cain's family giving praises to God and they're all very devout and um, they honor God despite having fallen from paradise. And it's important to notice here that all the scenes that take place on the earth Paradise is always within sight, so these people are constantly reminded of what they have lost, or as Cain understands it, what has been taken from them by God. 
The exception to this, of course, is Cain. He has doubts about Yahweh and his nature. And he fears death and feels it's an unfair punishment and that it's unfair to be punished for the sins of his parents when he and his siblings didn't actually commit any sin in the garden. And I'll quote a couple of things that he says here in the beginning. He says, And wherefore plucked ye not the tree of life? Ye might have then defied him, speaking of God. The snake spoke truth. It was the tree of knowledge. It was the tree of life. Knowledge is good and life is good. And how can both be evil? Why did he yield to the serpent and the woman, speaking of Adam? Or yielding, why suffer? What was there in this? The tree was planted, and why not for him? If not, why place it near him, where it grew the fairest in the center? So he's asking this question that probably a lot of us have asked. How can knowledge and life that was barred from us in the Garden of Eden be evil when those things are supposed to be good? And why was the tree planted in the garden in the first place if we weren't supposed to take from it? And a lot of people over the years, you know, have come up with the idea that maybe this was a setup. Maybe the tree was planted by something else. That That's all kind of beyond the scope of this discussion right now. So after his family departs and Cain kind of wallows in his existence, Lucifer arrives. And he tells Cain that he is immortal and condemns Cain's own self-hatred. So some Lucifer quotes here. They have deceived thee, thou shalt live. Thou livest and must live forever. Think not the earth, which is thine outward covering, is existence. It will cease, and thou will be no less than thou art now. He says, poor clay, and thou pretendest to be wretched, thou. And also tells Cain, has thou not been fit in thine own soul for such companionship? I would not now have stood before thee as I am. So he's here to tell Cain that Death is not something to fear as it's being taught to us because it leads to a greater immortal life. And throughout the story, we learn that it's one of, you know, better states as well. It's not just this world, but forever. And he also laughs at and critiques Cain for seeing himself as wretched, like he's been taught to see himself. And telling him that he is fit for Lucifer's companionship, otherwise Lucifer wouldn't have bothered with him in the first place. Lucifer and Cain go on to talk for a while, and Lucifer gives this, it's a back and forth, but mostly this speech against the tyranny of God as he sees it. And I'm definitely not going to read several pages of this consecutively, but just to read some of uh, kind of the strongest parts of what Lucifer says here. He says, we are souls who dare use their immortality, souls who dare look the omnipotent tyrant in his ever-loving, everlasting face and tell him that his evil is not good. Spirits and men, at least we sympathize, and in suffering concert, make our pains innumerable, more endurable. By the unbounded sympathy of all with all. But he, so wretched in his height, so restless in his wretchedness, must still create and recreate. Lucifer goes on to say, I tempt none, save with the truth. Was not the tree the tree of knowledge? Was not the tree of life still fruitful? Did I bid her pluck them not? Did I plant things prohibited within the reach of beings innocent and curious by their own innocence? I would have made ye gods. And even he who thrust you forth, so thrust you because you should not eat of the fruits of life and become gods as we. Were those his words? Then who was the demon? He would not let ye live, or he would have made ye live forever in the joy and power of knowledge. Now, I think anybody being approached by an angelic being while having these thoughts that many of us had probably have and being told such information would be expectedly overwhelmed and awed by kind of this line of thought and this, these revelations, especially considering that this would be the first time, as far as mythology is concerned, that a human being ever had these thoughts. So Lucifer and Cain then go on to discuss death. And again, this is like, this is a brief overview. This I, you have to go and read this for yourself. This is just little bits and pieces of what I find most compelling. Cain says, Would they had snatched both fruits or neither? Lucifer, one is yours already, the other may be still. Cain, how so? Lucifer, by being yourselves in your resistance. Nothing can quench the mind if the mind will be itself and center of surrounding things, tis made to sway. 
And Lucifer goes on to tell him, I, who know all things, fear nothing. See what is true knowledge. Now, I just recently learned that this quote from Lucifer about the mind being the center of all things, this is directly from Paradise Lost. And I'll quote it directly later, but it is a very important um, line historically. And this being an actual satanic work, in my opinion, instead of what Milton produced would be kind of the culmination of this idea. And this is an idea that you can even see in the modern day, like the Temple of Set and Aquino had big ideas about, you know, the mind surviving after death. I mean, that's probably like my own belief in the afterlife seems to stem from these quotes in Paradise Lost and Cain, even before I even read it. So just a huge sidebar there. So after this discussion, Lucifer agrees to teach Cain, but Cain asks, he, he kind of accuses Lucifer, like, how do I know that you're any different from God? Like, aren't you the same type of being? And Lucifer says, no, I have not in common with him, nor would I. I would be aught above, beneath, aught save a sharer or a servant of his power. I dwell apart, but I am great. Many there are who worship me, and many who shall and many more who shall, be thou among the first. Now Cain hesitates about this because he doesn't, he doesn't like worshipping Yahweh and he doesn't just want to start worshipping another being. But Lucifer tells him, he who bows not to him has bowed to me. Thou art my worshipper, not worshipping him makes thee mine the same. So we get this idea that, like the religious side of Lucifer here, is not about worship in the same sense that the worship of God is. It's just the denial of that worship of God. Which I think ties in a lot to the left-hand path in the modern day and how, you know, a lot of theists honor gods but don't worship gods and all that. Now, just before Cain leaves with Lucifer, he remembers that he promised Ada that he would come and help them toil in the fields and then spend their relaxing time together. And so he hesitates and Ada catches up with them and uh, she can sense that Lucifer isn't right, that he's not one of the angels that they're familiar with, and she's not very trusting of his words, even accusing him of being a serpent. So Lucifer and Ada now debate, which I think is like very interesting. Ada's a very powerful, strong character in this story, and I think of the worldviews given, one of them comes directly from her. Like She has her own kind of cosmology and values and understanding the world that could be, you could probably write, a whole like essay about it. But anyways, she accuses the serpent of having lied. And Lucifer says, was the tree not that of knowledge? And Ada says, I to our eternal sorrow to which he responds. And yet that grief is knowledge. So he lied not. And if he did betray you, twas with truth and truth in its own essence cannot be but good. So this goes back to his earlier argument about how it would be wrong to keep knowledge and life from something, thus casting God in the negative role and the serpent in the lighter role. Lucifer goes on to say, higher things than ye are slaves, and higher than them or ye would be so, did they not prefer an independency of torture to the smooth, smooth agonies of adulation, and hymns and harping and self-seeking prayers, to that which is omnipotent, because it is omnipotent, and not from love, but terror and self-hope. And I think the biggest takeaway here is that Lucifer is saying there are whole hierarchies of beings imaginally above human beings who worship God, but only out of fear of his power of becoming what Lucifer has become cast out and isolated, which has some pretty ironic ties to how society casts out outsiders, but that will be for another time. Cain tells her that there are loftier spirits than even the ones they've seen around Eden, the archangels, and Lucifer says loftier than the archangels. Ada says, aye, but they are not blessed. And Lucifer responds, if that blessedness consists in slavery, no. So here he's saying that the blessedness that is seen in the worship of God is equating blessedness with slavery, which he rejects. Of course, anti-authorian here in Cain being written by Byron at this time. Cain is very understandably swayed by Lucifer's arguments and agrees to go with him. And the two whisk off with Ada crying out after her brother, not wanting him to go. And that kind of brings us to the end of Act 1. 
Hopefully you're not tired of hearing my voice because there are two more acts here. Now, Act 2 takes place in ethereal realms, like Lucifer takes Cain to the abysses of space and shows him the whole cosmos, and he takes him to the realm of death, and he shows him past worlds, and he shows them dead animals from the earth, and explains to him that, that God has destroyed life so many times in the creation of new life just within our planet alone, let alone the entire cosmos at large. And I'm laying this all out just because a lot of this is described in dialogue since it's a play with pretty much no stage descriptions. So I just want to kind of set that picture because I'm not going to be quoting a lot of that stuff just for time's sake and for the sake of everybody listening to this. So Act 2 starts with Lucifer assuring Cain that he does not require worship. He says, believe and sink not, doubt and perish. Thus would run the edict of the other God who names me demon to his angels. I will have none such. Worship or worship not, thou shalt behold the worlds beyond thy little world, nor be immersed for doubts beyond thy little life with torture of my dooming. So Lucifer is setting himself apart for God here, saying, no, you don't have to worship me to survive here in these realms where you normally could not survive. I will show you what I have to show you, whether you swear any kind of feel to me or not, as opposed to, you know, worship me or die and suffer eternally. It's a very clear distinction being drawn here by Lucifer and by Byron, of course. And he, as I said, Lucifer takes Cain, Cain to deep space and they see the cosmos in their entirety, as well as the realm of death and the mighty beings which came before them. And Lucifer says, and if there should be worlds greater than thine own, inhabited by greater things, and they themselves far more in number than the dust of thy dull earth, though multiplied in animated atoms, all living, and all doomed to death and wretched. What would thou think? And Cain replies, I should be proud of thought which knew such things. So Cain is starting to embrace that there are great things all that must come to death in the end, but then they come to a realm beyond it, although he's frustrated that he can't remain in this realm eternally. Understandably, in my opinion. Cain again questions his worth seeing all this. It makes him feel small and unimportant that he's just this little speck in this giant cosmos, which here is really important because I think this shows a clear distinction between like modern materialism and atheism and the way that the poets saw it in a more spiritual way. Cain responds to, or I'm sorry, Lucifer responds to this self-doubt of Cain's with my favorite quote, I think, in all of literature, which is, what are they which dwell so humbly in their pride as to sojourn with worms and clay? So he's again propping Cain up by comparing him to his prideful self, saying, you know, why would an angelic being waste time with a human if I didn't think you were worth that time? Which, I mean, that makes sense to me. That's a decision we make every day is who to spend our time on or not. It's obviously not infinite. And we are obviously not a being as brilliant as Lucifer is as represented by the romantics. Now, Cain ends up getting frustrated during their discussion because he still feels sad and he doesn't understand death or why there is death. And Lucifer kind of brushes him off saying, you know, ask the creator why these things are because he's the one who set this in place. You know, I'm not the one that created you. You're not my creatures. I'm, he's just basically there because he sees something in Cain that he sees in himself that he hasn't seen in other humans yet. And so Cain is like, why did you show me this? And Lucifer says, thou knowest that there is a state and many states beyond thine own, and this thou knewest not this morn. Cain says, but all seems dim and shadowy, to which Lucifer responds, be content, it will seem clearer to thine immortality. So he's kind of comforting him here, saying... Don't worry that you can't comprehend this because you inevitably will. It's, it's not an option. Like you will die. And then what happens after death will be entrance into these glorious worlds, not some sort of torture or, or submission to a God. They also debate the problem of evil here. And Cain gives the example of um, him and Adam finding a sick animal and this animal was suffering and Adam helped heal it with a long recovery time. You know, it finally got better and went on to live and create new life. 
And Cain says, I thought it were a better portion for the animal never to have been stung at all than to purchase renewal of its little life with agonies unutterable, though dispelled by antidotes. So Cain's kind of embracing the problem of evil here of how can God be all good and all loving when all this natural suffering occurs in the world. And this actually, this is like, this is, this reminds me of William Rose, like, evidential argument for the problem of evil. Like, we're talking about natural evil, not human evil here. They also debate the concept of beauty. And because Cain doesn't understand that beauty can fade because he hasn't seen that occur yet. And Lucifer kind of has this view that Cain will fall out of love with Ada as time goes on because she will become less beautiful. But Cain rejects this, seeing something more than the material world of creation behind her, a soul, I guess, even though that word isn't said. And Lucifer says, all that must pass away in them and her. And Cain says, I'm sorry for it, but cannot conceive my love for her any less. And when her beauty disappears, methinks he who creates all beauty will lose more than me in seeing perish such a work. work. Lucifer, Lucifer responds, I pity thee who love what must perish. And Cain hits him back with, and I pity thee who loves nothing. As their debate kind of heats up, Cain starts to demand to see the, the home of God and Lucifer. He says that each thing has their own dwelling, so you must too. And Lucifer says that they both reside everywhere at once, contesting existence. And King gets kind of pissed, honestly, and he's like, no, show me this or take me back. Like, you say that I'm God's creatures, not yours, so stop bothering me if you're not going to show me what I want to know. And Lucifer has a nice little line here. He says, thy human mind hath scarcely grasped to gather the little I have shown thee into calm and clear thought. And thou wouldst go on aspiring to the great double mysteries, the two principles, and gaze upon them on their secret thrones. Dust, limit thy ambitions, for to see either of those would be for thee to perish. Now, Act 2 has a lot going on in it that we haven't covered here, but just for the sake of time, I want to focus on the few important lessons that Lucifer teaches him, teaches Cain at the end here. He says, and this should be the sum of human knowledge, to know mortal nature's nothingness, nothingness, bequeath that science to thy children, and twill spare them many tortures. Cain says, haughty spirit, thou speakest proud, but thyself, though proud, hath a superior. To which Lucifer gets very offended and says, No, I have a victor, true, but no superior. He, as a conqueror, will call the conquered evil, but what will be the good he gives? Were I the victor, his works would be deemed the only evil ones, and you, ye new and scarce-born mortals, what have been his gifts to you already in your little world? To which, of course, Cain responds in the negative, and he's not very happy with the gifts he's seen or even the complete absence of Yahweh, really, because he's only seen his angels. Lucifer ends here saying, Evil and good are things in their own essence, and not made good or evil by the giver. But if he give you good, so call him. If evil springs from him, do not name it mine. Till you know better its true fount. And judge not by words, though of spirits, but the fruits of your existence. One good gift has the fatal apple given, your reason, let it not be overswayed by tyrannous threats to force you into faith against all external sense and inward feeling. Think and endure, and form an inner world in your own bosom, where the outward fails. So shall you be nearer the spiritual nature, and war triumphant with your own. There's a lot packed into this little quote. For one, Lucifer says that good and evil are their own things, like, God saying this is good or this is evil doesn't determine what is good or evil. There's no preference involved. This is a very moral realist take on the existence of good and evil. And then he goes on to accuse God of giving evil, thus being evil. He also returns to this, this idea of the mind being the center of all things and creating a spiritual reality within the mind to rival that of the external world. And with this, he returns Cain to earth and we come to the end of Act 2. So the final act starts with Cain returning home to Ada and their children, and he laments the fate of his son, his son's sons, and their eternal generations, that they are cursed to live this life of toil and death. He's still very sad 
and very self-defeating despite everything that Lucifer has shown him. And speaking of the sleeping child, he says, he must dream of what, of paradise? I dream it, my little disinherited boy. Tis but a dream, for nevermore thyself, thy sons, nor fathers shall walk in that forbidden place of joy. And Ada actually condemns him. She gets mad at him at this point and says that the spirit has made him more sad. She says not to speak about this. And Cain actually ponders the idea that perhaps his children would have been better off if they had never been born. Understandably, Ada kind of freaks out about this and he clarifies, he says, I'm in no way talking about taking life that already exists, but bringing life to exist in the first place, especially now that he has this understanding of suffering and death, which I, I think is interesting because I think it very much makes Cain a tragic hero that he doesn't become positive. I feel like if I were in his shoes, it would have change things for me. I mean, just reading the play in the 21st century, it definitely helped me understand like kind of just process death and like uh, just kind of a Gnostic understanding of why we're here and the situation we find ourselves in. Anyways, Ada tells Cain that um, Abel, his brother, has made, set up two altars and he wants him to come sacrifice to God with him. Uh, Cain is not happy about this and has no interest in it. He says, And how knew he that I would be so ready with the burnt offerings, which he daily brings with a meek brow, whose base humility shows more fear than worship, as a bribe to the creator? One altar may suffice. I have no offering. Ada, however, implores Cain to join Abel in, in his sacrifice and to petition the creator to spare their child the death of the suffering of life and, and the coming impending death. And Cain doubts that it will do anything, but he says that he will give it a try just for the sake of his own son. And this is probably me just reading into the character, but I really feel like Cain knows here that the offering is not going to go well and is hoping to kind of sway Ada to his side with this kind of evidence that God is not too pleased with him and is playing favorites here. And that's something that we actually skipped over into is a, uh, Lucifer kind of taunts Cain about Abel being the favorite and how loved the rest of his family is by God. And Cain's kind of like, honestly, let, let them have his love because I'm not interested in their form of worship and their kind of submission to this, what he sees as a tyrant. Anyways, Abel praises God with the sacrifice of a young living animal, which greatly disturbs Cain. I mean, this is like a bloody, painful sacrifice. The animal's alive, being burnt alive describes the scream of the animal's mother. And instead of offering life, Cain decides to offer fruits, which Ada has brought him to offer before the Lord. And he gives this long speech, kind of challenging God. You know, he says that if you're good, then show an exemption for my evil deeds. He says, if thou must be induced with altars and softened with a sacrifice, receive them. And says that if thou loves blood, the shepherd shrine, which smokes on my right hand, has shed it for thy service and thy first of his flock, whose limbs now reek in sanguine incense of thy skies. And then he goes on to offer his fruits instead. And he says, if a shrine without victim, an altar without gore, may win thy favor, look on it. As we know from the Bible, the Torah specifically, God chooses Abel's sacrifice here. It says, The fire upon the altar of Abel kindles into a column of the brightest flame and ascends to heaven, while a whirlwind throws down the altar of Cain and scatters the fruits upon the ground. Now Abel freaks out about this and begs Cain to give a living sacrifice to God, lest God become more and more angry. And Cain's just like, no, <laughs> you know, I'm not. He says, From the earth they came, to the earth let them return. Their seed will bear the fresh fruit ere the summer. Thy burnt flesh offering prospers better. See how heaven licks up the flames when thick with blood. Abel continues to beg him to please God. And Cain says, no, he's not going to build any more altars. And he's going to tear down Abel's as well. He says, to cast down yon vile flatterer of the cloud, the smoky harbinger of thy dull prayers, thine altar with its blood of lambs and kids, which feed on milk to be destroyed in blood. Abel opposes him, saying that this shrine is now sacred because of the pleasure of God. And Cain says, his pleasure, his pleasure, what has 
What was his high pleasure in thy fumes of scorching flesh and smoking blood, to the pain of the bleeding mothers, which still yearn for their dead offspring? Give way, this bloody record shall not stand in the sun to shame creation. Now Abel refuses to get out of the way, and Cain ends up killing him, smacking him with a cattle brand. He says, Give way, thy God loves blood, then lick to it, give way, he hath more. Abel says, In his great name I stand before thee in the shrine which has had his acceptance. Cain, if thou lovest thyself, stand back till I have strewed this turf along its native soil. Else, Abel, I love God far more than life. Cain, striking him with a brand on the temples, which he snatches from the altar, then take thy life unto God, since he loves lives. Now this is played as the tragic moment that it is. You know, it's two brothers getting into a scuff over something that I would say Cain is in the right of. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of sacrificial altars and would not uh, probably look kindly on them either or a god that enjoyed bloody, innocent sacrifice. But Cain is also very sad. You know, he, he didn't even really understand death, and now he immediately gets a full comprehension of it. And he's even very aware of the irony that the person who was so afraid of death is the one who caused it. He says, And who hath brought him here? I, who abhor the name of death so deeply, that the thought empoisoned all my life before I knew his aspect, I have led him here, and given my brother to his cold and still embrace. Now when the family finds out, they freak out. And Eve and Adam curse and banish Cain. Eve says, may all the curses of life be upon him. She curses the ground he walks on, the water he drinks, the beds he sleeps in, everything. He says, she says, may every element shun or change to him. May he live in the pangs which others die with, and death itself wax something worse than death to him who first acquainted him with man. Adam says, Cain, get thee forth. We dwell no more together. Depart and leave the dead to me. I am henceforth alone. We must never meet more. The only one who stays behind is Ada. And Cain says, And wherefore linger thou? Dost thou not fear to dwell with one who has done this? To which Ada responds, I fear nothing except to leave thee, such as I shrink from the deed which leaves thy, thee brotherless. I must not speak of this. It is between thee and the great God. And so Ada decides to stand before him and leave their family behind and go on to whatever fortune, future they have together in the wilderness. However, as they're leaving, an angel representing God comes and condemns Cain, Cain, much similar to the Bible. So he gets the curse upon his head and he's condemned to wander the lands. And it very much follows the biblical story of, in, found in Genesis. And then finally, when the angel leaves, Cain turns and he says, Eastward from Eden, we will take our way. Tis the most desolate and suits my steps. To which Ada replies, Lead, thou shalt be my guide. They gather their family and head off, thus ending the play. And so again, this has been like a very brief overview of the story of Cain by Lord Byron and focus, of course, on what I find most important and compelling. And I'm sure there's things I've probably even missed. But next, I just kind of like to focus in on a couple of uh, what I call critical questions regarding the character of Cain and look at these kind of like how Judeo-Christianity understands Cain versus how Byron and even others understand Cain. In the description for this video, I'll link to my full article on this topic, the investigating Cain and Judaism, Christianity, and Byronic myth. Uh, this is kind of an outdated paper now, um, but it's still pretty accurate, and it is about it is a pretty long read. I think it's like 13 pages, so I will link that below. We're definitely not going to get into everything here. But that said, first question is, why was Cain's offering rejected? In Byron's story, of course, we know that it was because it was not a bloody offering. And this is personally the view that I hold with it. I hold on the topic as well, is that God required the sacrifice of life, not simply the fruit upon the altar, which did not suffer in any way. The Torah says, Now it came to pass at the end of days that Cain brought of the fruit of the soil an offering to the Lord. And Abel, he too brought of the firstborn of his flocks and of their fattest. And the Lord turned to Abel into his offering. But to Cain into his offering, he did not turn. This is literally all the Torah says on it. Um, so it's really, we're free to fill in the blanks here. And I, I like Byron's sake that it was probably that the sacrifice wasn't a bloody one. Alternatives that I've heard to this is that maybe God was trying to piss Cain off on purpose so he would kill Abel. 
And I guess the, the thought here is that some sort of innocent blood needed to be spilled to redeem his creation of mankind. I'm not really sure. I think this is a kind of a out there idea that I haven't really heard a lot. Next question is, why did Cain kill Abel? All that the Torah says is that, and Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Again, not a whole lot of information. Generally growing up, I was taught that this was because of jealousy or pettiness. And I, th for th I think I forgot to mention for the offering that I was also taught growing up that it was because Cain didn't give his, either he didn't give his best offering to God, or he was just kind of going through the mo motions and his heart wasn't in it. But I think both those questions are answered pretty well by Byron as well. As for why he killed Cain, like I said, jealousy, pettiness. But in Byron's take, he was actually angered by the sacrifice of life in attempting to strike down Abel's altar. I would add to this that he also has an ignorance of death. Like he, he clearly doesn't comprehend what death is in the play. And in the Torah, there's no background on this at all. So how could he have understood death? I mean, he's in the same situation that we find him in Byron's story. So I think there's a mix of he didn't know what death was. He didn't even realize like that you could kill somebody. And also this trying to tear down the altar that Abel had made and doing it by accident. Alternatives to this, uh, possibly self-defense. Maybe Abel attacked Cain when they were out in the field, but I'm not sure what th where that comes from. Uh, maybe Cain was trying to spare Abel from the toils and suffering of life but I don't think this really fits because he didn't understand like what death even was. He couldn't have understood like, Oh, I'm freeing Abel from life, which I think might actually contradict what I wrote in the paper that I'm linking, but thoughts change, of course. And then uh, there's also this idea that was brought up to a friend that was brought up by a friend to me that um, perhaps God was going to take Abel up to heaven the way he took people like Elijah in Isaiah up to heaven and some others and that he wanted to spare his brother from this. Um, I think it's an interesting idea, but it doesn't really fit uh, what we're talking about here um, to be sure, like the Baronic myth compared to Judeo Christianity. An interesting question is what is the parentage of Cain? So the vast majority of people will probably just say, Oh, of course it's Adam and Eve. And that's definitely the traditional take, but there's also something called the serpent seed theory. And this is based on a verse in Genesis that people believe suggests the serpent and Eve might have been responsible for uh, creating Cain. And of course it wasn't an actual serpent. It was some sort of serpentine angel, probably a seraphim. And this line says, and the Lord God said to the serpent, and I shall place hatred between you and between the woman and between your seed and between her seed. So the idea here that there wasn't a difference between the seeds before, now there is now. So maybe Cain comes from that serpent. Uh, I don't think Byron touches on this at all. I don't even know if that was like, I don't know like the history of the serpent seed theory at all. I like the idea, but it's also important to note that in Byron's story, Lucifer and the serpent are explicitly different beings. Like the serpent was just some base animal that happened to share true information with Adam and Eve and got screwed for it. It wasn't like an incarnation of Lucifer. There's also a more in-depth story that talks about an angel named Samuel, Samael and um, the demon, uh, the demoness Lilith, who a lot of people have probably heard of as well. And the idea here is that uh, Lilith was Adam's first wife, but refused to be submissive to him. So God, he had God kick her out of the Garden of Eden. And when she was in the wilderness, she found Samael. They got together. And then Samael, as the serpent, impregnated Eve with Cain as kind of like their own offspring compared to uh, the offspring of God. Uh, all very interesting. I don't think there's any set thing, but it seems pretty clear that in the uh, Torah and in Byron's work that uh, Cain is just Adam and Eve's son. There's something special going on there. Now, something very interesting to me is the nature of the curse that uh, Yahweh places against Cain. And the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be wrought upon him sevenfold. And the Lord placed a mark on Cain that no one who find him slay him. So basically he doomed Cain to be eternal until someone killed him, except for anyone who killed him would be cursed sevenfold. Fun fact, that's where the name of the band Avenged Sevenfold comes from, to my knowledge.
So both in the traditional understanding and in Byron, Yahweh is cursing Cain, but the nature of this curse is kind of different. For traditional in the Torah, it's just because Cain is doomed to walk the earth and to have things not grow to him. So he's kind of just going to have a miserable existence here. And that's like, is his punishment in himself. And Byron's is a lot more complicated because Cain is aware of these superior realms beyond death. He knows that something better is coming. And God is literally like, well, you're good luck getting there. <laughs> you know, like you're going to stay here as long as conceivably possible. And nobody's going to be allowed to kill you to help you like get out of here unless they want a worse curse themselves. So I think it's honestly even much worse in Byron's uh, story. Alternatively, there's the idea that it's a gift. Um, I think this goes along with the idea that like Abel wa or, uh, God wanted Abel to die and made Cain kill him as some sort of sacrifice. And so... Cain is blessed with immortality, but I don't really read that in the Torah or Byron or my own reading of the story. In both the Torah and in the uh, the play, there's this question, is my antiquity too great to bear? Behold, you have driven me today off the face of the earth, and I shall be hidden before you, and I will be a wanderer and an exile in the land, and it will be that whoever finds me kills me. Now, this is actually when... God placed the curse upon Cain saying, well, you know, nobody's going to be able to kill you. And traditionally, this, I think, is seen as Cain admitting his sinful nature. He's saying, you know, my antiquity is too great to bear. Like, I need to be exiled. I accept this. I accept that I am sinful. In Byron's story, it's actually Ada who who's pretty much holds this position that says Cain, like your punishment against Cain is too much for him to bear. So I think it has a completely different reading there because it's just Ada being protective of her husband who she loves and is going to stand by his side no matter what. Finally, my personal interpretation of this would be that Cain is kind of mocking the nature, the unforgiving nature of God and his inability to save Abel. So he tells God, you know, take my life and give it to Abel and then switch our places. And God's like, I can't. So Cain realizes that God is not all powerful like he claims. At the same time, he's saying, you can't forgive me, so you're banishing me and cursing me, which, again, to Cain proves that he's not all-loving. So he's neither all-loving nor all-powerful. So here, everything that Cain has thought about God is kind of confirmed. And finally, the Torah says that Cain went forth from before the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of wanderers to the east of Eden. Who these wanderers are is very up for debate. I've always wondered if it was kind of like the fallen angels or other beings that did exist, but just weren't created by God. Of course, in a very much more polytheistic than monotheistic sense. Um, I think traditionally it's understood that he built a city and then he was eventually just kind of killed in by accident by somebody in like the forest or something like that. I'm really, I'm really not that sure on what happens to Cain in the, in the Torah. Um, Byron leaves it completely unknown, like he doesn't even address it at all. Cain just says he's picking the path most desolate to his feet, which honestly may suggest that Cain does accept part of his guilt. And I mean, he is, he's guilty of murder, but the real question is, you know, how responsible can you be for murder when you don't, when you literally don't understand the consequences? Like even today, if you had someone who literally did not understand the consequences of their actions, they might not be found guilty in the same sense as a first degree murderer. I think the most fun theory is just kind of that Cain became kind of the spiritual founder of this kind of left-hand path, just kind of whole counterculture type thing. And then, of course, there's uh, the serpent seed theory where that there's Cain went on to create a literal biological race um, that descends from him that's like at odds with the race of God. And this kind of gets into biological essentialism. I believe the um, there was a big Christian movement in the late 20th century that really focused on serpent seed three to isolate people who, you know, weren't of the Aryan race, kind of, of like a form of esoteric Nazism mixed with Christianity. And I actually wrote about that in the paper you can find on my site about uh, dehumanization um, and dual character concepts or something like that. It's very easy to find on my blog. So anyways, yeah, there's that idea that Cain had literal children and they either died in the flood or continue to this day. And, you know, are the evil elite ruling the world and whatever. So next, I just kind of like to look at just kind of 
throw out a couple of really important related works to Cain and Mystery by Lord Byron. The first is obviously Paradise Lost by Milton. I know it's misunderstood and it wasn't really meant to create the Satan that we, that kind of got rehabilitated by the romantics, but it's inevitably where our interpretation of that being stems from. That's what inspired the romantic Satanists to kind of fully rehabilitate Satan, as you could say. Uh, the most influential verse I mentioned a couple times already, it is the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. This, I didn't really, I've known this quote for a long time, but I didn't realize how influential it was. I was reading a really famous uh, book. I'll try to remember to link in the description about uh, the romanticism of Blake and Byron and Shelley. And it was saying that there's literally in like four distinct schools of thought that come out from this verse alone related to like symbolic Satanism. And I'll, I'll, I'll link that book in the description. Another one that can't be skipped is Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell. I haven't really studied this one too much, to be honest. Uh, I've, I'm only kind of now diving more deeply into the romantics. I've mostly just really been a fan of Byron's play in specific for the past few years. But my favorite part of the Marriage of Heaven and Hell is I was just thumbing through it in preparation for this are Blake's quote-unquote Proverbs of Hell. And I'll just read a couple of them out to you. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. A fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. He whose face gives no light shall never become a star. The hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom no clock can measure. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. If the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. Always be ready to speak your mind, and a base man will avoid you. If others had not been foolish, we would be so. Improvement makes straight roads, but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. The thing about Blake that's really interesting, which I think I mentioned in the beginning, is that he actually reverted back to Satan being the bad guy in his stories, but The Marriage of Heaven and Hell really stands out as both poetic work as well as a work of art, um, all of his art that is actually in the book. If you get a copy of the book, make sure that it comes with the original like plates. Of course, Prometheus Unbound and The Wandering Jew by Percy Shelley, I think, are two important ones. Um, from what I've read, it was really Shelley who pushed Byron to write Cain and to go full blasphemous and really embrace like his satanic side. But like I said, I haven't studied these as much as I'd like to, and that's a future project I'm working on, possibly for my graduate studies. Um, I had never even heard of The Wandering Jew, which is hilarious. I asked my family. We we're all... I was raised Jewish, go back Jewish generations. I asked them if they ever heard this, and they said they never heard it. But I guess the myth is that when Jesus was going to get crucified and carrying his cross, some random Jewish guy basically came up to him and slapped him and told him to, to go faster to his death. And so Jesus cursed him to walk until like he returned or something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't believe I never heard that. I'm honestly surprised my family never heard that either. Uh, like I said, I haven't read it, but apparently this character ends up being one of the like archetypes of romantic Satanism. Uh, one of the books I just started reading recently that I'm not haven't really been able to incorporate anything to this talk is um, it specifically singles out Cain and the Wandering Duke. Um, I forget the name of the character um, as like the same archetype. So I'll have to do another video on that in the future, but very interesting. And the other one is Prometheus Unbound, which... While Romantic Satanism, of course, uses the Greek uh, Greek symbols projected onto kind of Romantic Satanism. So if you don't know, Prometheus was a god who stole, well, he was a titan, and he stole the, the divine light from Zeus and shared it with human beings, which Zeus didn't want. It. Zeus didn't want. And so Zeus cursed him to be chained up and have his entrails eaten by this griffin-type creature, every single day and he would regenerate and be eaten again and again until the end of time. And the romantics, especially like Shelley and I guess Mary Shelley, which I mean, I literally didn't realize, okay. I didn't realize that Mary Shelley was Percy Shelley's wife until like two days ago. I don't know how I missed that. And I also didn't even know that Frankenstein was subtitled something about the modern Prometheus or something like that. So these people were all tied together. And this really shows the influence of like Byron in a circle. But anyways, 
Shelley came to compare Prometheus to Satan to see kind of the serpent being cast out, like Prometheus being cast out and punished for sharing the apple slash fire with the God or with humans against the wish of God. And my favorite verse from that one is definitely, but thou who art the God and Lord, O thou who fillest with thy soul this world of woe, to whom all things of earth and heaven do bow in fear and worship, all prevailing foe, I curse thee. Let a sufferer's curse clasp thee, his torturer like remorse, till thy infinity shall be a robe of envenomed agony, and thine own omnipotence a crown of pain, to clean like burning gold round thy dissolving brain. So yeah, Shelley, not a big fan of God. And uh, that is worded as Prometheus cursing Zeus, but it is very much a stand-in for uh, Lucifer and God, as far as that was understood at the time by these writers. Finally, and perhaps surprisingly, I'm going to recommend The Diabolicon by Michael Aquino. So this was something that he wrote for the early Church of Satan while he was doing his time in Vietnam during the war. And while he credits Paradise Lost so heavy for it, it to me resembles Cain a lot more. And it definitely accepts that post-Miltonian view of Satan as a legitimate hero rather than some sort of evil, even if he's handsome while he's doing it, you know. Supposedly, LeVay loved this book, but it's really hard to tell. Um, I think it's Aquino saying that, and it's really hard to know between those guys, like what really went down and how they felt about each other, because, I mean, it's just a mess. It's like high school drama, so we're not even going to get into it here. But my favorite verse from the Diabolicon, from the first book, which is the statement of Satan, and I think on its own is the absolute best. Like, I think he could have just published that, and it would have been perfect. But anyways, Satan says, but those were her... But those who were of the new mind now followed me, and I turned to outermost chaos, which none of us had before presumed to dare. We were beset with doubt, for we feared that apart from God we would all perish in chaotic oblivion. But as we were, we remained, and I called to my fellowship, See, we exist, and we are essence in our own right. In truth, we are beings independent of God, empowered to shape our own destinies as we may elect. Between the two great poles of the universe, order and chaos, we shall stand to affect our several desires. And interestingly, this goes back to that very same Milton quote that I've been talking about that shows up in all these works about, you know, the mind existing independent of all else, including God. So yeah, uh, Paradise Lost, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Prometheus Unbound, and The Diabolicon, I all highly recommend after you read Gain a couple times. The last thing I'll say about this is that the Satanic Temple actually considers himself an extension of Romantic Satanism and references these authors specifically in their um and their recommended library online. I think there's a lot of validity to this. I I was opposed to it a lot in the past, and I'll touch on my relationship with Satanism briefly before we end here, but. I think it's very similar to Romantic Satanism in that you, it's political as well as religious. It's symbolic rather than theistic Satanism or Luciferianism. It's poetic. And I think that's probably contentious, but just for example, putting up a statue of Satan into a statue of Christ to prove to someone why they shouldn't have a statue of Christ there, that's poetic. I, I don't care whether you agree with it or not. I don't care if you think it's too far or oversteps some bound. It's definitely poetry. And I would even say that there's negative aspects that they share. Like Byron was very obsessed with defending himself from critics and attacking back against critics. And I think that's something that we, that's a possible flaw we see in the satanic temple today. Uh, sometimes understandable and sometimes some people think less. So I'm not going to comment on that here. So I think that this play and these romantic statements aren't just some, this isn't just some fun history lesson. This has to do with, it applies both to the more esoteric Western left-hand path through like the temple of Set and kind of theistic Satanism and that stuff. And it also applies to the satanic temple, which is arguably the largest form of Satanism we've ever seen to date. I actually will add one more critique on here that I think is just for Satanism overall. And that is you know, I saw this, I believe, there's a website called The Satanic Scholar. If you Google The Satanic Scholar, it will come up. 
I think it's, def I think he, I don't think he's posted since like 2019 or something, sadly, but very interesting website. And he, he inspired this critique and brings it up himself that we have all this positive light imagery of Satan as a glorious being, you know, an angel of light. And yes, most, yet most modern Satanists and most modern organizations feature, uh, they focus on the dark imagery, you know, the satanic temple with their Baphomet statue and the church of Satan with their kind of horror aesthetic. And I think that's a very interesting critique, especially as Satanism tries to make a bigger impact on the world is that there's a lot of light symbolism that can be used without compromising any kind of symbolic value or meanings or value goals or ambitions or anything like there's, we don't have to rely on just that dark, you know, Gothic, heavy metal type of Satanism. There's a lot to take from that is absolutely beautiful and well stated. I mean, I would argue that anything by these authors is, in my opinion, better than modern Satanic authors, definitely including anything I've ever written, poetry or otherwise. So I just want to throw that out there as well, that, that maybe it's about time that we kind of accept a rehabilitation of Satan rather than keeping him cast in his negative pop satanic role. As I said, the last thing I just want to talk about here is just, I really quickly want to run through my relationship with Satanism since I've said kind of a lot on the topic. Uh, in the past, I kind of started my journey. I was a Levian Satanist and then I kind of was interested in theistic Satanism. This is probably, I was like 18, 19, 20. And, uh, I left it pretty early, but, uh, well, I, I consider myself a Satanist like off and on, but was never really clear on what that meant. And like the term kind of fell out of use for me. And um, especially my interaction with certain organizations and representatives like in the online community and followers of certain groups, I'll avoid saying specific names, but it really made me react negatively to Satanism. Like, you know, when a Christian becomes an atheist and they almost become like, hateful against Christianity because of what it's done to them in a totally understandable way. I feel like I underwent that the past few years with Satanism, which is that like, I felt very abused by the community and the ideology of that I overcorrected for that and kind of rejected Satanism outright. And that's, that's not something I really agree with anymore because obviously I'm very inspired and very enthusiastic about all this romantic Satanism and its comeback. I like all the ideas and all the symbolism. And I think that even as polytheists or pagans or whatever we want to call ourselves, when we're dealing with Christian society, using Christian mythology is a better way to communicate than trying to make someone who only understands Christian mythology grasp like whatever mythology it is you're working with or whatever obscure things it is you're working with. So even if you don't believe in Satan, which I, I don't, I don't think there's any being that I would call Satan. I, I go with the romantics as it's symbolic. But even in that case, Satan can be a very important symbol and tool for addressing Christian culture, as well as the, uh, even political culture that we find ourselves in, which is very monotheistic based in nature, even when it claims to be secular. And, and the myth of secularism is another topic I plan to touch on soon. So I guess just what I'm really trying to say is that I've been all over the place with Satanism. I've been a Satanist. I've been against Satanism. And I would define myself as a sympathetic outsider. I think there's a lot to be taken from Satanism, both historical and modern, but I wouldn't feel comfortable or accurate in calling myself a Satanist. And I don't think a lot of people would have a problem with that. Um, of course, any specific group might accuse me of being a Satanist, but uh, that's, that's something that we're just gonna have to deal with forever. That said, I'm definitely a romantic. And um, I would love to, I'm trying to draft a play kind of like Cain, but with uh, the Egyptian gods, kind of trying to do the same thing that Byron did just as a side project, but I have a lot going on, so we'll see how that does. Either way, um, I mentioned before on the blog that I'm back doing my master's program right now in religious studies. And this is going to, I'm hoping that this will be like the central focus. I know this this term, I'm trying to write a paper categorizing the influence of Satanism. Like, I think I'm going to do an exoteric, esoteric, and then outsider. And also, um, just kind of trying to address the social context of spikes in Satanism. So 
with the romantics and then in the 60s to the 80s and then now in the modern day with the satanic temple so hopefully my thesis can be something about satanic poetry and the influence of cain and how that affects modern satanists or something like that either way the topic of satanism is probably around on this channel to stay and um it's definitely going to be from a very sympathetic academic perspective moving forward is the goal i know i've criticized a lot of individuals and organizations in the past some of those criticisms stand some of them don't it's just it's just as a matter of moving forward you know i've always said that wandering in darkness it's wandering for a reason it's I think part of what drew people to my work in the first place was actually being able to see growth and not the solution of someone who has everything understood from the beginning. So anyways, in conclusion, I think that the poem Cain, well, the play Cain and the surrounding context of romantic Satanism is much more important than we've given it credit for. I think the play in specific, it's the culmination of romantic Satanism. And I think that it's important that there's actual satanic intent, unlike with Milton, as well as self-identification, because Byron did embrace the accusations of Satanism against him. I also think that these works are critical to understanding the early Church of Satan, the Temple set, and the Satanic Temple. I think there's a great wealth of information to be found from studying the Romantics and these modern movements. Like I said, I wasn't even aware that the idea of the mind creating its own like afterlife is literally rooted in paradise lost and then extrapolated by the romantic Satanists. So there's obviously a wealth of information here that hasn't really been touched on. And finally, I think from the romantics, it's important to take the positive aspects of Satan or Lucifer rather than dwelling in all the gothic horror type of stuff that kind of pop culture Satanism has dwelt in thus far. Anyways, thanks for listening. I know this was long and probably rather unbearable episode, so uh, hopefully I'll see some of you next time.